that in April, my birthday month, <laughs> I would like to very specially invite you to help me welcome Reverend John, the beloved, our pastor, who is going to deliver a message of hope and gratitude and love this morning. Reverend John? Yep. You see? Thank you. I'm not going to say I need a wife. Good morning, family. <laughs> a joy for me to add my own words of welcome to the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living here in beautiful, warm Jamaica. And a special welcome to Katrine's parents. Katrine is, well, they're here for something really special, which is uh, Katrine's wedding on Friday to Prince Charming, I call him. <laughs> um, so Edwin and Katrine, um, we're so happy to have you with us. And Mr. and Mrs. Smith, lovely to have you. Let us give them a round of applause. As we say in Jamaica, them come from Farin. If you drive around Kingston at this time of year, you, you are greeted by a blaze of yellow pui trees all across um, the countryside, and they are spectacular. But the pink pui, which is not as, as, as common, um, is just breathtaking and miraculous in its, in its beauty. And we happen to have one uh, at the north side of the property, just by the Sunday School Garden. It, is in, it was in full flight this past week, and it was just absolutely amazing. And today's encouragement, as I call my, my messages, has been inspired by that um, blooming pink poetry. So I've called it the parable of the pink pui. <laughs> you think it was only Jesus one who spoke in parables? <laughs> Me too. If Jesus lived and, and ministered among us today, I can just imagine him saying, verily, verily, I say unto you, the kingdom of heaven is like a pink pui tree planted by a great truth teacher at the gate of the temple. And the tree took root in the fertile Jamaican soil and grew strong and tall, spreading its branches to the heavens in a wordless sermon on life, offering its unconditional love, its shade, and its beauty to all. You know, one of the things that, that amazed me about nature is that the pui isn't saying I'm more beautiful than the yellow pui or the common hibiscus that in Jamaica we call shoe black that grows wild in the countryside. Each creation is just its own perfect self, the way it was created to be. And this is for me is indeed a sermon on living. Can we bloom where, where we are planted and can we give our best to life without judgment and without comparison and without you know that little thing we have in the back of our mind, I am better than, or you are better than, or I'm not as good as. All of nature sings a psalm of praise and of gratitude to the creator and is just its own perfect self. And you know, people pass, as the parable goes on, that tree when it's not in bloom, it's just a mass of green leaves. And they perhaps don't think about the potential that lies within that, that great creation. And then one day in April, without warning, the tree bursts into bloom, and it is just miraculous. It is just breathtaking. Where were those blossoms all along? It's just as if overnight. It sheds all the leaves, and then there they are, a, a, a blaze of pink against an azure sky. And it is just to warm your heart and, and to give you a lesson that perhaps you might want to contemplate this week as we approach what is known in Christendom as the Easter season. And so the great teacher that planted the tree and who had always known its awesome potential breathed a prayer of thanksgiving for the fruits of her labor over the years. She had lovingly planted many seeds 
and watered them with her love and nourished them with her prayers. And she had waited patiently for each to bring forth fruit according to its kind. And you will pardon me, friends, if I'm a little emotional because you see I'm one of those trees our founding minister, Dr. Elmer Lumsden, planted. And like so many of you, my heart overflows with love and gratitude for her faith in this teaching and for her loving husbandry and for her marshalling of our lives along the principles that we call the science of mind. And you know, the story is told that when she was leaving New York, where she had been working and studying, to come to Jamaica to, to open up a, a center. Uh, it wasn't, she wasn't planning on a church, she was going to have a study group. Somebody said to her, you, you, do you think Jamaica is ready for this teaching? And she said, I don't know, but I'm going to find out. And how many of us have dreams and plans and aspirations that we would love to put into, into operation, but we think, I don't know if the world is ready for it. I don't know if I am ready for it. And it may fail, wow, there, there is the fair, but there's a bigger fair, what if I succeed? What am I going to do with that success? It never happened to you, it just takes your breath away because you think, wow, it's me. You know, it's, 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 it all centers around me. And that's when we have to remind ourselves that it is not really us, but that power and presence within us which really does the work. And if we can just surrender and say, not I, but the Father, Mother, the Creator within me that's doing this work, then we can allow our feet to be kept upon the perfect path as we go about the business of building our dreams. And that's what our founding minister did. She came and she planted the seed in the universal subconscious mind of a teaching in this island. And just like the Pui has no idea how many lives it has touched and how many people it has inspired with its beauty, I don't think she ever knew the amount of people that, that her life was, was just transformed by knowing her, by being in her presence, by sitting in one of her classes, and by extension, if you weren't lucky enough to have known her, to at least be coming to this center to, to learn the principles of truth that the master teacher said sets us free. And so I want to thank the community quadrant of our Thriving Ministry Initiative for the suggestion that we dedicate the month of April to giving thanks for the good in our lives generally, and in particular to expressing our gratitude for the differences the teaching known as the science of mind has made in our lives. I'll never forget bringing an old aunt of mine to church here a few years ago when my mother was still with us on this plane and she said, Cass, why don't you come to church with Johnny and I? And so she came and she sat in stony silence while Reverend Elmer spoke. And that day, Reverend Elmer spoke on the subject of there being no sin and my aunt thought I had invented it, so um, <laughs> she found that a little off-putting. But, um, at, you know, she was gracious and she sang the hymns and whatever and read the responsive reading. And on the way home I said, so Anne Cass, how was the service? And she said, it's for thinkers. <laughs> well, I'm going to say, you know, think. You don't? She said, yes, I think. But it, it, it's a teaching that's for people who are um, cerebral and intellectual. And I thought, it's also a teaching for people who, who can open their hearts. Because this is where you access the divine. Yes, you, you know, we, know, we know all the facts and the, the, the theories up here, but that's not where you experience God. You experience God when you're standing underneath a poetry and seeing those blossom falls and there's a carpet of gold or a carpet of pink around your feet and you breathe in the air and think, my God, my God, isn't this just an amazing expression of life and of love and of unconditional givingness to the world. So you see, friends, this business of gratitude is really so important because what you praise, you raise. The word appreciate means to increase in value. And so we are going to use the power of appreciation to increase our value as a community whose very presence on the face of the planet is helping to transform and raise human consciousness. 
What happens, my friends, in the natural world also happens in the realm of spirit. That happens in the, in the total life of humankind. So each year, all nature experiences the resurrection. Dramatically visible in northern climes as nature arises from the death of winter and spring arrives on eager feet to offer everyone the freshness of new life, new energy, and new hope. In Jamaica, we are blessed with a, a milder transition, aren't we, from one season to the next. But as one writer put it, and I quote, who knows not spring in his heart has not risen to the person he can be, unquote. Edward Gibbon, the 18th century English historian who wrote the history of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, asserts that, our three, or that for 300 years, the followers of Jesus' teaching healed the sick and did other mighty works by their faith in the higher laws made known to them in their gospels. But, but that, in his opinion, as Christianity became more rich and worldly, the knowledge of those higher laws was lost. As we know, modern science and quantum physics are now proving the soundness of these early teachings. And these teachings were not just unique to Christianity. The scriptures of every religious faith are luminous with examples of the working of spiritual laws and principles. So that now modern science is co corroborating that which for untold ages faith has taught. It's funny, eh? we've come full circle and now modern science is saying, yes, there's something here that the ancients knew. And so this firm faith which we hold here and teach here at the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living is that an infinite intelligence, love, and personalness undergirds, pervades, and supports everything that exists. All life, and that includes each one of us, is a living demonstration and disclosure of the divinity that indwells all creation. For the truth is, all creation is divine. Nature's laws are God's laws, and like their creator, are infinite in depth and meaning. Let us affirm together, my life is a testimony of love, light, and joy. Can we say that? My life is a testimony of love, light, and joy. I am living proof of divine causation. I am living proof of divine causation. I live in accord with the laws of life. I live in accord with the laws of life. Please turn to your neighbor and say, your life is a testimony of love, light, and joy. Namaste. Your life is a testimony of love, light, and joy. Namaste. Your life is a testimony of love, light, and joy. Namaste. I said to you, neighbor, not the whole church. <laughs> Let me ask you, do you believe that the science of mind teaching can lift up and liberate the consciousness of people? Yes. Oh, wow. Do you sometimes wish that everyone you know could be taught this life-altering truth? Yes. I'm not convinced. Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, our thriving ministry council, as you've been told this morning, um, is coordinating, uh, that is coordinating our thriving ministry initiative, wants your input and support as we plan strategies for spreading truth. We want people to have the opportunity to improve their lives through our teaching, but we also want to offer it in ways that they enjoy and can understand. I read an amusing uh, anecdote by the late Roman Catholic mystic, Father Anthony de Mello, who writes about a man, a man who's, um, he was a dog lover, and we have a few dog lovers in, in, in our congregation. And he ha had taken to force feeding his Rottweiler a large tablespoon of cod liver oil every day. So he would grab the, his pet, hold the head between his knees, force his jaws open, and push the spoon of olive oil into his mouth. And of course, there was a big struggle every day. And one day, in the struggle, um, the dog broke loose and the olive oil spilled all over the ground. And to his great surprise, his pet turned around, licked up the olive oil from the, the floor, 
the cod liver oil it was, from the floor and from the spoon. And then it occurred to him that it wasn't the oil that the animal was against, it was the manner of administration. Mm -hmm. So, we want you to, um, you're going to be getting the survey that, uh, that Carol shared with you by email, if you're on the email list, and there are also hard copies here on the two ushers' desks. And we want you to spend three minutes and give us the input, because we want people to get the truth, but we don't want to force feed anyone. We want to, to hear your opinion about how you think um, we might best take this teaching beyond the, the four walls of the temple and, and share it with people whose lives it can touch. Dr. Ernest Holmes, the founder of, the, uh, of our teaching, writes, and I quote, a religious science church is a place where only two things happen. People are taught about a divine presence and a universal law of good, which reacts to it. And people are taught how to use it. That's all. We have nothing else to sell, unquote. Dr. Holmes further says, and I quote, a religious scientist is humble before the greatness of things, but is not afraid of the greatness of things. For our future is a matter of one person who has come to know what God is. One person who has come to know what God is. Then two, then three, then a hundred, wherever our church may appear." Unquote. Our church, then, my friends, is more than the building and the beautiful grounds. Our church is a state of consciousness, the consciousness of service, the consciousness of love, the consciousness of unity, which we must raise if we would transform this country and indeed the world. Each one of you has an important role to play, and the time has come for us to support that which we have been saying we believe by putting our love of truth into action, thereby lifting the consciousness of our countrymen and women. The raising up of consciousness, my friends, is the mystical meaning of the Easter story which Christendom will celebrate, excuse me, <coughs> later this month. John announced in John 11, verse 25, that Jesus was the resurrection and the life. The implication is that we live beyond physical death, that life lives eternally, and that we can share in this and know it within ourselves. Because the truth is, we too can say, and we too must say, I am the resurrection and the life. That resurrecting power is within every blade of grass, within every tree and every flower, and that resurrecting power is within each and every living thing, including ourselves. It is truly one of the great mysteries, but then so is the transformation of a tiny wind-blown seed into the magnificence of a pink pui tree. Alan Watts, the British-American philosopher, put it this way, and I quote, only poetry and symbol can even attempt to describe the strange and unexpected transformation that invades a person's whole being. It has many names, eternal life, the spirit of God, the indwelling Christ, the victory over death, unquote. We students of science of mind know that life comes into manifestation in all created forms. As our declaration of principles reminds us, the manifest universe is the body of God. It is the logical and necessary outcome of the infinite self-knowingness of God. You are a result of God knowing itself as you. Isn't that wonderful? God knows itself as you. When you look into the mirror, um, today, just say, God knows itself as me. Praise God. It's just such a wonderful, a wonderful thought, yes? Can we say it together, God knows itself as me? God knows itself as me, himself, herself. You can call God what you like because it's within you. It's your consciousness that is embodying it. And so as Easter approaches, take time to ponder the mystery of the eternal life that you are. Be conscious of divine love, ever creating, guiding, and fashioning your larger experience. It is power coming to fulfillment in your present day, transforming the old into the new person. 
It is the deep knowledge that mortality and immortality are two aspects of the one life, which is God and which is your life. And your life will take on an eternal meaning and a new dimension by your realization of your union, your personal relationship with the divine. You will find that upon the horizon of all your doubts and fears or despairs, there shines a light. And in the silent moment, to coin a poetic phrase, the voice of truth may whisper in your ear, have no fear, oh have no fear, the poo will bloom another year. Namaste.